In this video, we are going to discuss 10 ways to support sexual abuse survivors. If you're a survivor listening to this, know that there are people out there who want to support and help you, and that this episode is going to be beneficial for you as well, because these might be 10 ways that you can support yourself. If you're an advocate or an ally listening to this, I want to thank you. Stay tuned for each and every one of these ways to support sexual abuse survivors. I know that these things have helped me in my healing, and I know that they can help so many others as well. Hi, my beautiful friends. Welcome to the Danielle Shea podcast. My name is Danielle Shea, and I'm your host, and I'm a healing coach for sexual assault survivors and a lived experienced expert. That means that I'm a survivor too, and my mission is to ensure that all survivors know healing is possible. This platform, along with my coaching programs, are all designed to turn survivors into thrivers. I want you to live a joyful and fulfilled life. And if you're ready for some healing, let's dive into today's episode. Sexual abuse is a prevalent issue that affects millions of individuals every year, regardless of age, gender, or background. Survivors of sexual assault often face significant challenges in the aftermath of their experiences. This includes feelings of shame, guilt, isolation, hopelessness, the list really goes on. As a community, it's our responsibility to provide support and resources to survivors to help them heal and thrive. Thrive is the word that I really love there. I don't call the survivors that I work with survivors. As a survivor myself, I actually really don't like that word. Instead, I opt for thriver because I don't just want to survive. I want to thrive. In this episode, we are going to explore 10 ways to support survivors or thrivers from Things like believing and listening to them without judgment, to advocating for their rights, and even taking care of ourselves. Because if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of anyone else. By following these tips, you can play a role in creating a safer and more inclusive world for everyone. So let's jump into the 10. Number one, and I don't know how many times I'm going to say this throughout this episode that this is the most important thing, but I really feel like this is the most important thing. Number one is believe survivors. This is the first and most important way to support survivors of sexual abuse because many people don't believe them. It can be incredibly difficult for survivors to come forward and share their experiences, especially if they fear that they won't be believed or that they'll be blamed for what happened. And this happens over and over and over again. As an advocate, whether you're a friend, family member, member of the community, or a trained professional, it's important to believe the survivor and offer them your support. So what does it mean to believe the survivor? It means listening to their story without judgment and taking their experiences seriously. It's not your job to determine whether or not their experience was quote unquote bad enough to qualify a sexual assault. Rather, it's important to acknowledge their pain and trauma and support them in any way that you can. It's also important to avoid victim blaming because when you victim blame, this is really saying that you don't believe them. It's also important not to question the survivor's behavior or choices that led up to the assault. Please hear me when I say this. Survivors are never at fault for their own assault, and suggesting otherwise can be incredibly harmful and damaging. Instead, focus on providing a safe and supportive space for the survivor to talk about their experiences and then begin to heal that process or begin to start the healing journey. Many survivors, if they aren't believed from the first person that they tell, will just stop their healing journey altogether. And the first person that they tell is often the most important person in that survivor's healing journey. I know it may sound overwhelming, but it truly is a gift when someone comes up to you and shares their story with you and allows you to have a sneak peek into their vulnerable, maybe even shameful feelings. By believing survivors and offering them your support, You can help to break down the shame and the isolation that accompanies sexual abuse. 
You can help create a safe culture of support and empathy that encourages survivors to come forward and seek the help and resources that they really need in order to heal and move forward. Number two, listen without judgment. Now, if you're like me and you always want to help people solve their problems, this one can be really hard. Not the judgment part, but the listening part. Oftentimes when people come to us with a problem, we try to solve it right away. But really what we need to do is show empathy and compassion by listening. And we listen without judgment. This does go hand in hand with the first tip, which was to believe survivors. But also it deserves a little bit more insight to talk about what listening without judgment means and why it's important. So too often, survivors are met with skepticism or blame when they come forward, which can compound the trauma they experienced. Instead, we need to offer a safe and non-judgmental space for survivors to share their stories and experiences. When you listen without judgment, you show survivors that you believe them and that their experiences are valid. And this is a powerful step in the healing process. As survivors often struggle with feelings of shame and self-doubt following an assault, often blaming themselves, they don't need someone else to validate the fact that they should be blaming themselves because, again, it is not the survivor's fault. So you listen without judgment by creating a supportive and empathetic environment. It also means avoiding any suggestion that the survivor is to blame for their assault. They should never be made to feel as though their behavior or choices cause their assault. If this is something that's difficult for you to do or to wrap your head around because you're trying to rationalize the situation as all humans do, then it's just better to sit and listen. Be there. Be a body that is safe. Be a body that can be confided in. And if you have your own doubts about the situation, try not to voice them to the survivor directly because again, their experience was not their fault. Okay, let's go on to number three respect their decisions. Everyone who has experienced sexual violence has a unique story and each of their healing journeys is going to be unique and different. With that knowledge, survivors must be empowered to make decisions that are right for them. As individuals supporting survivors, it's crucial that you respect their decisions and respect their boundaries, whether this decision includes seeking counseling or not or pursuing legal action or not. By honoring their choices, you can help survivors regain control and feel more empowered, especially during a time where they feel powerless. You can help them make the right decision for themselves by providing them with all the necessary information and resources so they can make informed decisions, but ultimately, the decision should be left up to them. Now, there is a caveat, right? If a survivor is going to be harmful to themselves or others, you might need to step in in order to really persuade them to get additional help. There are nuances to everything. Ultimately, you can't change someone. You need to let them do the changing. But their safety is first and foremost. Let's move on to number four, providing resources and information. You can honor their choices, like we talked about, and provide them with as much information as possible so they can make informed decisions. This helps them regain control and feel empowered, like we discussed. So one way that you can support survivors feeling control is by providing them with the right information and resources. Empowering survivors with knowledge and resources can help them take the necessary steps towards healing and recovering. And there are a variety of resources available, including support groups, therapy, legal advice, medical care. By providing survivors with a list of resources or pointing them in the right direction of organizations that specialize in supporting survivors, you can help them navigate the process of healing. For a non-comprehensive list of various resources, check out the link in the description. It's going to take you to my website where I have a page dedicated to resources for survivors. It's crucial that survivors have access to accurate information about their options and the healing process itself. For instance, many survivors may not be aware of the different types of therapy available, or they may not know how to access legal resources. And by providing survivors with information about these options, you can help them make informed decisions. 
Don't worry. You don't need to have all the answers. Helping them find resources that are right for them by searching for them together can be incredibly healing within itself. By doing this, you help them feel like they aren't in this all alone. And that in itself can help them feel safer and more confident. Number five, create a safe space. A safe space is an environment where someone can feel comfortable expressing themselves and seeking support without fear or judgment or ridicule. To create a safe space, it's important to start by listening actively, like we discussed, and responding with empathy. This means validating survivors' feelings and experiences, avoiding any language or actions that may be triggering or dismissive. And if you don't know what those things are, that's okay. Give yourself grace. I actually was just having a conversation with a friend about something that happened in real time. There was a person who said something offensive, but it's a offensive thing that is often brushed over. So we ended up having a conversation and they thanked me for educating them that they didn't know that this was upsetting or hurtful and they had never thought about it this way before. I thanked them for allowing me to provide that education for them because I couldn't provide it to the person who said it. It just, it wasn't the time or the place and I didn't have a relationship with that person in order to really have a constructive educational conversation. So instead, I had a conversation with the person I did have a relationship with, and it went over so well. And the reason it did is because we already had that rapport. They already knew that I had their best intentions, and I knew that they had my best intentions. And so we were able to learn and grow together. So as you're learning through all of these things, it's okay if you mess up. You're not perfect. You're not supposed to be. You're not supposed to have all the answers. The most important thing is, being a safe space and letting them know that you are in uncharted waters here for yourself, if that's true for you. And that way, both of you can provide space for each other. So what are some other aspects of creating a safe space? Another crucial aspect of creating a safe space is promoting confidentiality. Survivors may be hesitant to come forward for fear of being judged or ostracized or fear of retaliation. So it's important to respect their privacy and ensure that their information remains confidential. Creating a safe space starts with being a safe person. If a survivor has come to you with their story, it means that they feel safe around you and they may be looking to you for validation or support. And by creating a safe space, you can also help eliminate any potential barriers that may prevent survivors from accessing the support that they need. And that's why we discussed sitting with them to help them find the resources that they need. Number six, avoid victim blaming language. We did discuss this in a previous tip, but it's important to address victim blaming or victim shaming further. Even with a safe space, the language you use can still be harmful if you're not mindful of your words. Victim blaming language makes survivors feel as though they are to blame for their assault, which again, they are not. This can hinder their healing process. It's important to avoid victim blaming language and instead support survivors in a way that promotes healing and empowerment. One way to avoid victim blaming language is to shift your focus away from the victim and onto the perpetrator. For instance, instead of asking, why were you wearing that? You could ask, why did the perpetrator feel entitled to assault you? By doing so, you acknowledge that the responsibility lies on the perpetrator and not the survivor. Also avoid asking questions like, Why are you just bringing this up now if the assault happened in the past? Oftentimes, survivors grapple with their own experiences, believing that it didn't happen or that they somehow asked for the assault or even caused the assault. Acknowledge and appreciate the courage that it takes to say something, even if the experience happened years or decades ago. I can't tell you how many of my clients are opening up for the first time in decades. Yes, decades. There are people who have been holding this secret for 30 plus years. It doesn't matter if it happened yesterday or 30 years ago. The pain is real. The experience is real. And when we're not educated, we can often let our own biases lead us to victim blaming without even realizing it. 
By actively listening to survivors and acknowledging their experiences, you can support them without perpetuating harmful stereotypes or myths. Sexual abuse, assault, or violence is never about attraction. What someone is wearing, what someone was drinking, or how someone was acting. Sexual abuse is always about power. So when you take away those external factors, you're able to avoid using victim-blaming language. When in doubt, say things like this. I believe you. It wasn't your fault. I support you. Help me understand what happened further so I can make sure you are safe and you get the support that you need. Since we just talked about our implicit biases, I think it's time for a little bit more education with tip number seven, and that's understand the effects of trauma. One crucial aspect of supporting survivors of sexual assault is to understand the effects of trauma. Sexual assault has long-lasting impacts on a survivor's mental health, physical well-being, and sense of safety. Survivors may experience symptoms like anxiety, depression, flashbacks, and difficulty trusting others. And all of these can manifest immediately after the assault or years later, making it important to offer ongoing support and understanding. I encourage you to keep listening to this podcast or checking out the blog so that way you can continue to educate yourself on what survivors need. Tip number eight, attend events and programs. One way to continue your education and deepen your understanding of the effects of trauma is to attend events and programs focused on supporting sexual assault survivors. These events may include workshops, support groups, or panel discussions featuring survivors and experts in the field. Not only can these events provide valuable information and resources, but they can also serve as a reminder that survivors are not alone in their experiences and that they are humans too. By attending and showing your support, you can help create a community that values and supports survivors. I encourage you to check out the events that are ongoing in our community. I'll include a link in the description below. Tip number nine, advocate for their rights. Attendees of events and programs focus on supporting sexual assault survivors not only gain valuable information and resources, but they also have an opportunity to learn about ways to advocate for survivors' rights. Through advocacy, individuals can work towards creating a world without sexual assault by promoting change and raising awareness. And advocacy can take many forms, things like lobbying for policy changes or organizing fundraising events for local survivor support organizations. Or even simply listening to a survivor is advocating for them, letting them know that help is out there, letting them know that they have rights. Whatever the action may be, it's important to remember that every effort counts towards creating a safer and more equitable society. By actively advocating for these issues, all of us can help create a community that values and supports survivors. It's important to remember that advocating for survivors' rights can be emotionally taxing, so it's essential to take care of yourself in the process. In order to continue supporting survivors, you need to prioritize your own well-being. And that is the last and final tip, tip number 10. Take care of yourself. I encourage you to take breaks when necessary. Seek support from friends and family. Practice self-care. All of these are important steps to ensuring that you're able to continue advocating for survivors. So... Taking breaks when it's necessary is key to preventing burnout. When you feel overwhelmed or emotionally drained, stepping away from your activism to focus on yourself can be incredibly helpful. And please know that taking care of yourself is never selfish. Taking a step away or taking a break could mean taking a day off or something as simple as taking a few deep breaths. It's important to listen to your body and give yourself the time and space that you need. Seek support from friends and family is another important aspect of self-care. Talking to loved ones about the difficulty of your advocacy work can help ease the emotional burden. They can also provide a much-needed listening ear or offer words of encouragement during difficult times. And this is incredibly important because just as you are a listening ear to others, you need someone to be a listening ear to you. Advocates need advocates. Coaches need coaches. Therapists need therapists. We all need support and community. Finally, 
Practicing self-care is crucial to your overall well-being. I know you know that, but it still begs to be said. This means taking care of yourself physically, mentally, and emotionally. Get enough sleep, exercise regularly, drink your water, do something that you enjoy, take time for yourself. It's essential to help you continue supporting survivors. With my clients, I tell them that I want them to live a joyful and fulfilled life. And you know what? In order to be able to tell them that, that means that I have to do that too. So I enjoy my life. I do fun things. I spend time with the people I love. I go on trips. I take breaks. I get sleep. And the reason that I do that is because I love myself. I want to take care of myself. This is my life. I should be able to enjoy it. And the more I enjoy it, the more I get to help people. My example of being my most authentic self, being my most joyful and fulfilled self, is the example that I want to show my clients and that I want to show the world that my experience, that my assault, it did not break me because I am not breakable and I am not broken and neither are my clients. We might feel broken, but we definitely aren't. So by showing up for yourself, you're setting an example for the people that you advocate for. And that is such an incredible power to have. Okay, let's recap. Advocating for the rights of sexual assault survivors can be emotionally taxing, but taking care of yourself is essential to being able to continue supporting them. By prioritizing your well-being and practicing self-care, you can ensure that you are best equipped to continue advocating for change and creating a safer and more equitable society. Supporting survivors of sexual assault is not only a moral imperative, but it's also a fundamental step towards creating a community where everyone feels respected and safe. By believing survivors, creating safe spaces, providing resources, and advocating for their rights, we can help survivors heal and thrive. Remember, every action we take can make a difference in someone's life. Let's work together towards a world where sexual assault is not tolerated and everyone is treated with respect and dignity. Wow, that was incredible. Did you get as much out of listening to that as I did in creating it? I hope you did. I hope you found it helpful and powerful, and I hope that it allowed you to take action and choose yourself today. If you found this to be helpful, please share this with someone who needs to hear this message as well, because we don't need to heal alone. Thank you so much for choosing yourself today and for listening. I'll see you next time.